Hello, I'm Luis Serrano and this is Serrano Academy. And in this video, I'm going to tell you about Kolmogorov Arnold Networks. Kolmogorov Arnold Networks are this fascinating new architecture of neural networks presented by Liu and his co-authors in this paper. And the main idea is that in this network, you don't train the weights, instead, you train the activation functions. The inspiration behind these networks is the Kolmogorov Arnold theorem, a beautiful theorem in mathematics that roughly says that every continuous function can be expressed using mostly addition. So in this first video, I'm going to tell you about the architecture of the Kolmogorov Arnold networks. And in the second video, I'm going to be telling you more about the beautiful mathematics behind the theorem. Are you ready? Let's begin. So let's start by reviewing our multilayer perceptrons or regular neural networks. They have an input layer, they have an output layer, and they have a bunch of hidden layers. In this example, they're going to have two hidden layers. And they have edges between every node on a layer and every node on the next layer. Kolmogorov Arnold networks are very similar. They also have an input layer, output layer, and middle layers, and a bunch of edges connecting each layer and the next one. However, the main difference is the following. On the regular neural networks, you have fixed activation functions. You decide what they are beforehand. You could say I'm going to have a bunch of sigmoids or hyperbolic tangents, and then I'm going to have a bunch of relus. It doesn't matter what you do, but once you decide, they're going to be fixed forever. And then what you train is the weights. So the weights on the edges are numbers, and the whole point of training a neural network is to find the set of ideal numbers or really good numbers that will model your data pretty well. Now in a CAN, which is how we're going to abbreviate Kolmogorov Arnold networks, the opposite happens. We have fixed weights, so every edge has a weight of one and those are unmovable. And instead we train the activation functions. So over here we have a bunch of weird functions and the idea is to find the perfect functions that will help us model our data. Actually, a more accurate drawing of the architecture is this one, where in the nodes we have plus signs that say that everything that comes to the node gets added with coefficients of one, and on the edges we have functions. So everything that goes from one node to the next passes through the function. Now let me be more specific by focusing on one particular node of the neural network. Let's say this one over here. So on the left, that's a multilayer perceptron, we're gonna have the output of this node which is sigmoid of w1x1 plus w2x2, assuming that we picked an activation function of sigmoid, but as I said, we could have picked anything else, a relu or a hyperbolic tan or anything. And in here, the inputs are x1 and x2, and the weights are w1 and w2. So these are the trainable weights. These are the numbers that we train using the neural network and that we optimize. Well, on the right, on the can, the opposite happens we have that the output is going to be f1 of x1 plus f2 of x2. The sum is always going to be fixed, and I like to imagine this sum as a 1, and this 1 becomes a coefficient on both of the sum ends, but we can just not have that there. And the trainable part of the neural network is these functions over here, f1 and f2, which as you can see can be anything, and then the output is f1 of x1 plus f2 of x2. But let's go back to how we train these neural network, a regular neural network. Well, let's say that our data set gives us a loss function in the right, and the point is to find the bottom of this loss function, the minimum value, or at least a pretty good local minimum. So we start with some random values. Let's say we're going to start with two zeros, and that gives us a high loss because if we pick random values, we're likely to not be at the optimal point. And then we continue changing these weights using gradient descent and descend all the way to the bottom to find an optimal low point of the loss function. And that gives us some pretty good numbers. And once we've found the minimum of that function or a good local minimum, then we have some pretty optimal weights over here. So for a can, it's the same thing, except we have trainable functions. So we start over here at a random point with some random functions. And let's say we start with the function zero, but we can start with any random functions. And the idea is that as we descend and get lower and lower losses, the functions change and we get better and better functions until the point that we reach a minimum here. And here we reach the best possible functions. Now, as you can see, there may be a bunch of problems. For example, how do I train functions? I know how to train a few numbers, a few weights 
but functions are too big. They have too many parameters. If I want to describe a function, I may even need infinite parameters. So what is the solution? Well, we're not going to take all the functions, but we are going to vastly simplify them. So we're going to try to find a smaller family of functions that we can express with a bunch of parameters, and then we're going to train those parameters. And for this, we need something called splines. A great way of approximating functions is using splines. So let me tell you what a spline is, and in this case, they're called B splines. So let's say that the optimal functions for this node in a neural network are these two functions over here, this one and this one. Now we're not going to find them because the space of functions is too big, but we're going to approximate them. And how do we approximate them? Well, let's say I'm going to take the interval and cut it into three equal parts, for example. And I'm going to find a really simple function that approximates the function on top. It's this piecewise function over here. It consists of three segments at height 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 0 0.7. So that's not great, but it's an approximation of the function. And for the one at the bottom, I can do this. Three segments on heights 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and minus 0 0.1. Again, it's not great, but it's an approximation. And the good thing of these approximations is that they're described by a small set of numbers. They're described exactly by three numbers, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 0 0.7 for the first function, and 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and minus 0 0.1 for the second function. That gives us six trainable parameters, and I can train a neural network with six parameters. So that's the idea. Now, let me tell you what B splines are. B splines are small functions that we can add to approximate a function, just like we did, but in a more formal way. So the simplest type of B splines are constant B splines. And let's say that if I cut the interval into three pieces, these splines are this one over here, which is one in the first interval and zero on the other ones. This one, which is one in the middle interval and zero on the others and this one, which is one on the last interval and zero on the others. These are the basis functions. And if I want to approximate the function in the left, I simply find a combination, a linear combination of these splines. For example, I'm going to multiply the first one by 0 0.1, the second one by 0 0.3, and the third one by 0 0.7. And notice that that only changes the height of the interval that is at height one, because all the other intervals are at height zero. So they're still zero. And now when I add these three, then look at what I get. Well, the zeros don't add anything. So I end up with the function that I'm using to approximate the function in the left. These three numbers that I'm using here, that's called the not vector. And in this case is 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.7. So that is the vector corresponding to the approximation in the left. Now for the second function, something similar happens. Now I need 0 0.6 times the first B spline plus 0 0.8 times the second B spline plus minus 0.1 times the third B spline. These numbers can be negative, no problem. And when I add them, I get an approximation of the second function. And I get this over here. And now my not vector is 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and negative 0.1. And that's going to be the three parameters corresponding to this edge over here. And of course, we didn't get the actual function, but we approximated it decently. And we did it with six parameters. So we vastly oversimplified the functions, but we're able to play with them and get something good. Of course, as you can imagine, we can use much better B splines to get better and better approximations. There may be more numbers involved, not vectors may be bigger, but we can do much better and get closer to the functions. So let me show you. So first we use constant B splines. Now we're going to use linear B splines like this. As you can see, these are piecewise linear function formed by joining segments. And the height of the peak doesn't really matter, but let's say it's one. Now, if we're going to approximate this function, then we need something like 0.1 times the first one plus 0.4 times the second one plus 0.8 times the third one plus 1.2 times the fourth one. Notice that the numbers are higher on the bottom because the function looks a lot more like this spline than it looks like this spline on the top. So therefore, when we add them, we get something like this. The sum of these functions is some piecewise linear curve that, as you can see, is better approximation than the one we got with the constant B splines. And so now we record the not vector corresponding to these four numbers. And for the one on the bottom, we can do something similar. Let's say that the not vector is 0 0.1, 1 1.1, minus 0 0.2, and 0 0.2, and the sum is over here. 
and notice that we did all right. We did a little better than before and we get this knot vector and this approximation over here. Now, as you can see, we did decently with linear B splines. We did better than with constant splines. So we can keep going with more complex functions. We can also use quadratic B splines, which could look like this. As you can see, now I'm joining little bits of quadratic functions to get the splines and we can do better here. We can actually get something much closer to the function like this. And of course, here I divided the interval in three, but if I were to divide it in a higher number and use a lot more splines, then I can do much better and get much, much, much more accurate approximations. Of course, now the knot vector is much bigger. Now I have seven parameters for each node instead of three. So the number of splines and the kind of spline you use are hyperparameters. The more you can use, the better, but obviously you still wanna have not that many so that your network doesn't get so complicated. Now the notation is as follows. So we have an edge like this and what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the splines we're gonna use. In this case, I'm gonna use four splines like this and they're quadratic splines. And if you multiply each one of them by a certain number, that's the knot vector over here. So what we're gonna do is we are going to put the four splines in between and connect them with edges. And then the knot vector is going to be recorded. And those are the weights of our new neural network over here. So in order to approximate that function, we use the four numbers underneath and the corresponding splines. So here is how a big can looks like. We have an input layer. Each node has a bunch of splines. We're gonna say that we're gonna use three for simplicity. Then that connects into another layer. And then that connects into a layer of splines. And then that connects into another layer and so on and so forth. And the trainable parameters are going to be the knot vectors that we are going to train using gradient descent, just like with a regular neural network. Now, as I mentioned before, universal approximation and representation is the inspiration for Kant's, in particular, the Kolmogorov Arnold representation theorem, which looks pretty complicated, but it's not that bad. Now, here's a slide that I love that was given in a talk by Liu, one of the authors of the paper. And it pretty much says that in regular neural networks, everything is based on the universal approximation theorem. Whereas in Kolmogorov networks, everything is based on the Kolmogorov Arnold representation theorem. Now, roughly the universal approximation theorem says that you need a two layer neural network to approximate any function. And the Kolmogorov Arnold representation theorem says something very similar, that you only need a two layer Kolmogorov Arnold network to represent any function. So in other words, what this says is that you may have a really large neural network in both cases, but you're only gonna need one of two layers to do the job. That means to model your data set. Now, why is it that we have networks of more than two layers? Because this is mostly a theoretical result. You could have a really, really large layer and we don't want that. So that's what we go for more layers. But if you could have extremely wide layers, then you could always do this with two layers at most. So in the next video, I'm going to tell you more about how to represent functions, mathematical functions. So for example, here's a network that represents the product of x1, x2. Here's a network that represents e to the sine x1 squared plus x2 squared plus sine of x3 squared plus x4 squared. So stay tuned for the next video. There's gonna be a lot more math, but I promise you this Kolmogorov Arnold theorem is one of the most beautiful results I have seen in mathematics. So that's all folks. Thank you very much for your attention. As usual, if you like this video, please hit like or share it amongst your friends or put a comment and even better, subscribe to the channel so you see more of this content. There's also an option for joining, which you can join me and get a bunch of perks. You can also get these perks if you support me on Patreon. And the perks are really nice. You can get early access to videos, you can get live Q and A's with me, and you can also get your name on the videos. So definitely very much appreciated if you'd like to support me. You can also follow me on Twitter, Serrano Academy, and you can check out my page, serrano.academy, where I got all the videos and a bunch of courses, blog posts, etc. And I also have a book that I wrote it's called Rocking Machine Learning. So if you wanna check it out, I have a 40% discount code. You can check the link in the comments. So thank you very much and see you in the next video.